Good morning and welcome to Prime Time at the PU Library. Prime Time celebrates learning in and beyond the classroom of Bethel faculty, students, and staff. And is a collaborative project between the Friends of the BU Library, Faculty Development, and other offices on campus. After today, our next scheduled presentation is not until Thursday, October 31st, when students uh, Sean Doherty, Lizzie Carson, and Renee Pagler will share about their summer working alongside community leaders in Frogtown and Summit University neighborhoods in St. Paul. Today, we're going to hear from one of the Faculty Excellence Award winners. Each year, the Bethel faculty members nominate their colleagues who exemplify the highest levels of teaching, scholarship, and service, and select three for special recognition. The Faculty Excellence Award for Scholarship was given to Dr. Ray Van Aragon, Professor of Philosophy. Dr. Van Aragon came to Bethel in 2005 after completing his doctorate at the University of Notre Dame under the mentorship of renowned philosopher Dr. Alvin Plantinga. His scholarly record contains three books on the philosophy of religion and numerous articles and book chapters in the literature of his field. He has served in a leadership role for the Society of Christian Philosophers and as a grant reviewer for the Coalition of Christian Colleges and Universities. But today, we're going to hear from his heart about why philosophy of religion matters to him. Welcome, Ray. All right, it sounds like it's working. Um, yeah, so uh, I have published in philosophy of religion. That's my main area of interest. Um, I'm interested in epistemology too, I mean the justification of religious beliefs, so that, that crosses over philosophy of religion and epistemology because it, uh, it raises the question, what does it mean to be justified in religious belief or in any belief at all? Um, so that's been my uh, primary interest in philosophy of religion, overlapping with, uh, with epistemology. So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about um, how philosophy of religion helped me. Uh, most of the things that I uh, write about in the philosophy of religion actually do matter to me personally. I mean, some of it's sort of fun, you know, some of the philosophy is kind of fun. You know, I teach uh, epistemology and metaphysics and we talk about time travel, which is enormous fun to me, uh, but it's not quite as, you know, life affecting as, as uh, the stuff I work on in philosophy of religion. So what I'm going to do for the, uh, I'm going to interrupt myself periodically. Um, but I'm going to stick to my script so I don't go long. My wife, when she read this, she thought I was going to go long. Um, so I will not let that happen. So, um, I, so here. Uh, I should start by saying that I am or remain a Christian because of philosophy, and in particular because of philosophy of religion. I don't know if this is true of many people. I think that philosophy in general gets a bad rap for driving people away from religious faith. That certainly does happen. I've seen it, but it did not happen to me. Indeed, some philosophers who lost their faith because of philosophy published in philosophy of religion in order to explore those arguments that initially drove them away from religion and to defend their new non-religious beliefs. So I've got a book, um, the second edition just came out, which is Debates in Philosophy of Religion. And so you often get you know, debates between Christians and non-Christians over whatever. And very often, I don't know if it's quite often, not the, very regularly that non-Christians were Christians, they were raised that way. And I uh, came to regret it, but still care. So that's why they write on the subject. So that didn't happen to me either. Uh, philosophy of religion actually helped me to retain my faith, and I write and publish on the subject in order to explore and justify my continuing to do so. So I should say a little bit about how all that happened. So here's where the autobiography comes, and it won't be long. As some of you know, I went to Calvin College, um, where I majored in religion, theology, and philosophy, so B PTS effectively, and philosophy. I picked up the religion theology major largely because of the kindness of a professor named Phil Holtra, who really mentored me and with whom I could have serious and honest discussions about Christianity. I could say what I wanted, uh, what I thought. Um, I chose philosophy partly because of the professors, but also because of the subject matter. 
Uh, moreover, I'm a person highly prone to skepticism, which uh, philosophy, uh, people interested in philosophy often uh, share, a, a tendency to ask questions and not to right away believe the answers. So, how did my academic pursuits connect with my faith? Well, I'd say there were two main lines of argument that initially drove me away from them. Um, and I'm going to um, get to the first one here. There we go. Um, so, uh, two kinds of argument, and then I'll, I'll indicate what pulled me back, so to speak. And again, it's philosophy of religion. Now, I, this is a short talk, so I'm going to leave a lot, of, uh, a lot of things unclosed. I can't, you know, we teach courses on this. So, um, uh, so I'm going to sk skate over these uh, problems pretty quickly since we don't have much time in these sessions. Um, and these are serious problems for lots of people. And you might as well, you know, look at them in the face. So the first was the problem of religious diversity, which I have up here. Yeah. Um, and, and there's the kind of the question that captures it. You look around the world, there are millions, even billions of people and other uh, members of other religious groups. They seem devout, they care, um, they're wonderful people, they're virtuous, upstanding, and so on. Um, and why should I think that I'm right and they're all wrong? I mean, there are Christians too. Um, well, Christians disagree about a lot of things too. So um, it's intuitively problematic. If so many people disagree with me on matters of religion, these matters of ultimate importance, and I believe matters <coughs> with evidence, it's quite inconclusive. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into that a little more. Um, how I think the evidence is inconclusive. The question arises, why should I think I've got it right? If I had been born in some other country or some other time, I wouldn't be a Christian. Why well, think that given all these contingencies, I happen to believe what's true, and all these millions and billions of other people are wrong? Why should I think that I'm so special? So those are troubling questions. Now notice it doesn't quite, uh, I mean, there's not quite an argument there, right? Um, but these are still questions and, and ideas that sort of um, rattle you a little bit, especially when you first start to think about them seriously. Um, how can they all be wrong and I'm right? Again, given that if I had been born there, um, I would believe what they believe, probably. So the problem of religious pluralism, and you see up here, um, John Hick, you can't uh, read that. Uh, an interpretation of religion, human responses to the transcendental. So I read John Hick. I don't know if any of you, if many of you have heard of him. Uh, here's another book he's got, A Christian Theology of Religions, so, um, uh, which is a really accessible book if you want to explore uh, what he thinks about these things. So the solution to the problem of religious diversity that appealed to me in college when I first read it, and frankly one which I still don't find totally ridiculous, um, you can see the intuitive appeal was proposed by a British philosopher named John Hick. Now John Hick uh, writes in his autobiography about how uh, he was in England, I can't remember the city, but he grew up, grew up there, uh, was teaching there, and um, had a lot of interfaith engagement for various reasons. And um, he says in his autobiography, I, I sort of, as I, as I work with these people from different religious uh, traditions, I sort of came to realize we're all doing the same thing. Um, and that's kind of where his, where his theory here is, his solution, solution, his approach to the problem of religious pluralism uh, takes him. So uh, Hick's basic idea is this. There is one divine reality, and all other major religions, all major religions, are culturally influenced responses to that one divine reality. So it's not quite that we're worshiping the same thing, but we are, in a sense, responding to the same thing, but want responding to it differently, uh, in part because of the way this divine reality appears to us is culturally determined. Okay, so for us, you know, we worship, we think of the divine reality as an omnipotent, omniscient, perfectly good being God, and of course, Eastern religions have a different take on the divine reality, um, and you know, and the monotheistic religions more or less are the same um, as Christians on that basic point of what God is, what God is. So what Hicks says is that none of these religion uh, religion gets it right. It's right what this divine reality is like, um, and the reason for that is that this divine reality called the real. So I kind of like that. What would you know, being interested in the real experience <laughs> <laughs> not connected at all. 
um, but that's what he calls it, this, the real, this divine reality. And the reason none of us gets it right, none of the religions get it right, is that this real is beyond all human comprehension. Okay? It's, it's, uh, as he says, and this is influenced by Immanuel Kant, some of you are familiar with this distinction between things as they appear to us and things as they are in themselves. The idea being we can only have access to things as they appear to us and not as, as they really are. Well, I'll apply that to the divine, uh, this divine reality, this real, and we can perceive that God, this real appears to Christians one way, appears to others in different ways, um, but we don't know, we can't grasp, we can't even conceptualize what the real is in itself. So this is um, John Hicks' view. Um, so as I, uh, all major religions are responses to the same thing, the real, and we can tell that they are because they all call on their followers to devote their lives to some divine reality and no longer to themselves. So this is what he saw um, in his uh, community, his interreligious community. Um, what you have in religions is people turning away from self-centeredness and turning to centering their lives and so on in this divine reality, which they describe differently. Um, so I have I have this book. So here's how here's how he envisions things ultimately turning out. Okay, religions are all more or less the same. Um, they're all worshiping the same reality uh, in different ways. Um, and so how is this all going to work? How is this going to end up? Uh, and what he says. Um, so given that we're all sort of on the same team. So uh, what is to be hoped for in the future? He says I would think is that the different religious traditions while continuing to be distinctly different, will each gradually winnow out the aspect which entails its own unique superiority and increasingly influence one another in interfaith dialogue with some degree of mutual transformation in which each enriches and is enriched by the other. Eventually, we may hope the relationship between the religions will be rather like that between most of the mainline sections of Christianity today. So the idea is that over time, you know, religious differences will not become as significant, um, and uh, it's not like we'll all come together and everything will be great. But you know, there's sort of that hope that um, religious fighting will end because we'll realize we'll realize that we're all doing more or less the same thing. So um, this picture appealed to me uh, in college, and this general idea, you know, you can see where he's coming from—the idea that there's a divine reality that we're all worshiping. The reason we worship differently is because of uh, different traditions and so on that we come from. But it appealed to me because in a, in a sense it purports to be objective. Looking at the major religions from outside, so not from a Christian perspective, but from get, getting out and kind of looking at them all, um, and you strip away the details, it can appear that all major religions are fundamentally the same. They all, in some form, call on their followers to turn to a higher power and turn away from the self. So there's some truth to that. John Hicks' picture provided for me a good explanation of why this is so. And that view appealed to me. Okay, so that's one thing, the problem of religious diversity. Thank you. Um, now, I mentioned that John Hick argues that when you strip away all the details, religions are fundamentally the same. Now, for him, um, you might wonder what a detail is, what details need to be stripped away. And one of the obvious ones, the a real um, uh, impediment, a real obstacle when it comes to Christianity is this claim that Christians make that Jesus is somehow unique and that Jesus actually is divine um, and that Jesus is the way to this salvation, not just to you know changing your life and becoming less self-centered, but Jesus offers us the way to salvation that no other religion offers us. So um, what he argued then, what Hick argues, is that that's one of the details that needs to be stripped away. Um, it doesn't fit his picture for Christ to be divine or to be anything more than a person specially tuned to the divine reality, sort of kind of like a prophet sort of person. So this is, brings me to the second line of argument that for a time led me away from the Christian faith. So here we go. The historical Jesus. Uh, when I was a sophomore, I took a religion class on what's called the quest of the historical Jesus. And yes, the quest of the historical Jesus. It started by, oh, you can see it, Albert Schweitzer. He, was a, he did a lot of things, um, to say the least. But this is one of the things that um, obviously was important in biblical studies. So in the question uh, that, that this quest 
asks is, what was the real guy like? I mean, you've got the Christ of faith, right? That's the distinction between the Christ of faith and the historical Jesus. And what um, these historical biblical scholars were trying to figure out is, what was the real guy like? I mean, um, there's the guy worshipped in the church. There's a guy, you know, um, in various ways depicted in the Bible in certain ways. Okay, get beyond that. What's the real guy like? So I really did enjoy this class, and it went through the work of scholars from the last 50 years or so who attempted to determine what the real Jesus was like, and that uh, quest was sort of kicked off by Schweitzer, not, I mean, in some ways kicked off by him. Now, the working assumption was not that the Gospels and the church had got it right. Instead, scholars started from outside the faith. So you see this uh, objective reasoning uh, point there. I mean, we're not going to assume that the church got it right. We're going to step outside of that, look objectively, and sort of start from the start and see what we can figure out just from the historical documents. So they used evidence to uh, determine uh, that the Gospels were written well after the events they purportedly recorded. So from Bible 101, you probably are familiar with that kind of idea, right? That um, some of the letters of Paul are written, you know, 20 years after the fact, or, uh, and then the Gospels are put together sometime between uh, 70 AD and 100 or so, uh, with John being the last. Um, so, okay, I'm not saying, by the way, that Christians can't accept that part, um, but anyway. That's, that's sort of a starting point. Um, that's, that's one of the things that these historical biblical scholars uh, arrive at. Um, so uh, they used evidence to determine that the Gospels were written well after the events. And using this objective reasoning, this reasoning that did not assume that the Gospel stories were true, that this story, they conclude that the stories were likely adjusted and adapted through the years and that the final versions handed down in scripture were heavily influenced by the agendas of the gospel writers and of the sources from which they got the material. Based on this reasoning, and perhaps the assumption that miracles don't happen, and hence that miracle stories are just stories, these historical biblical scholars concluded that Jesus probably didn't say much of what the gospels attributed to him, in particular the gospel of John. The, the thought is that the gospel of John uh, contains very few uh, words that Jesus himself actually said. That's the latest of the gospel. And moreover, that the church's understanding of Christ is vastly different from the real guy. Each of these scholars came up with different ideas about who Jesus really was and what his message really was. And as a matter of fact, those accounts tend to differ quite a bit as well. Um, but for the most part, I drew a most troubling conclusion from all of this. Namely, that I, in fact, had no good reason to think that Jesus was who the church said he was. And the supposed in evidence from scripture wasn't really evidence at all. So you've got the, the objective, I mean, the historical Jesus um, uh, issue that uh, rocked me in my sophomore year. You've got the religious diversity um, issue that came somewhere around the same time. But of course, um, uh, John Hick is all in favor of this historical Jesus stuff. It fits perfectly with his claim that Jesus isn't, that these details about Jesus aren't really essential to Christianity. Now what he argues in this book, and it's just, just briefly, he argues that Jesus didn't actually say he was the Son of God. That Jesus didn't mean that. that. When Jesus said he was the Son of God, either people were putting words into his mouth, or he didn't really mean that. Okay? He meant it in some different way. So that's, John Hick uh, jumps on that damn way. So as a result of my encounter with these two kinds of arguments, I lacked Christian faith for a pretty significant part of my college years. And it was good because I had professors, like the religion professor I mentioned who I could talk to about this. And he did uh, you know, judge me and all. Um, though I did at one point come and uh, tell him that I was an atheist, and he said, no, you're not. Um, and uh, you know, I, I don't know, I suppose I tried atheism for a week and it didn't take. So, so that, was never, that was never a problem exactly. I've never had any trouble with belief that God exists. It's just the Christian part. So, so um, I like Christian faith for a significant part of my college years. I believe that Christian belief was not sufficiently supported by evidence and that a more objective take on the religious landscape could just as well lead to a view of religious pluralism like the one endorsed by John Henry. So um, it was philosophy that brought me back. 
Um, and what brought me back was not Christian apologetics. It wasn't arguments and evidence that Christian belief is true. Um, uh, so you hear that a lot, right? You have people um, debating about the evidence. Well, that wasn't what uh, did it for me at all. As a matter of fact, those kinds of evidence tended to increase my skepticism, the same skepticism that brought me to philosophy in the first place. And they still do. Um, I, when I hear the arguments about, you know, for the resurrection or whatever, I don't like hearing them because right away I start thinking about where the holes in the arguments are. And um, so my skeptical side uh, uh, goes, uh, goes to work and it returns uh, to all the skeptical arguments that appealed to me in college. So perhaps those arguments about the historical Jesus, that he really was the guy that the church thinks he was, um, the arguments are good for some people, but they're not for me. I mean, I believe that the church got Jesus right, but not on account of the arguments um, at all. Like I say, those arguments tend to backfire on me. So, uh, those arguments uh, wake up the skeptical, somewhat cynical side of me, and when it comes to my faith, I prefer that that side stay asleep. And I think <laughs> I have good reason for preferring that, but at any rate, um, those arguments don't help me at all. So, um, here we'll get to my last slide, so here's my last point. Uh, this guy, Carol mentioned Alvin Flanaga. I didn't know what else to put on this slide. Here's the guy. He was my <laughs> dissertation director and very influential, very important to me uh, in my life, which is why I wanted to work with him and was very uh, grateful that I could. So Alvin Flanaga, he's a hero to many people, many Christians in philosophy, period, because he really um, helped to start kind of a Christian philosophy renaissance in the last 50 or so years. So, as I say, the way that philosophy of religion helped me was not by provided, providing me with the evidence that my Christian faith was true. Instead, it helped me because I read the work of Alvin Plantinga in particular, and also a, a friend of mine named Steve Evans. So here, just so you know, so Alvin, I'm gonna sum up in about you know five minutes this lovely book, um, and also uh, this book, which is actually this is the this is the first one that really helped me. It's called the Historical Christ and the Jesus of Faith, and it's and it's by C. Stephen Evans, who used to teach at Saint Olaf actually for many years, uh, but then he moved to Calvin um, when I was when I was there my senior year or something, stayed there for a while, and then went to Baylor. But the thing about this book, so I had taken this Historical Jesus class. Um, and it left me at sea, right? It left me, it left, I didn't know what to do with it except for that I was deeply skeptical about the church's account of Christ. So um, then uh, when I was a senior, Steve Evans, um, I took a class with him and he said, hey, I've got this book, this one, um, and I need someone to proofread it for me and make the index, could you do that? And I said, why not? Um, but it was very important to me because it finally helped me make sense or come to grips with this historical biblical scholarship. It sort of taught me what to do with it um, in a way that was very helpful. Um, Life-changing, as a matter of fact. So, um, so the way that philosophy of religion helped me was not by providing me with evidence that Christian faith was true. In fact, Alvin Plantinga and Steve Evans, uh, they argued that evidence isn't needed for rational Christian belief. I didn't think I had compelling evidence for the resurrection and for the divinity of Christ, and as I say, I still don't, but Plantinga argues that's not where knowledge of those truths come from. Likewise, knowledge of God's existence does not come from arguments, and it doesn't need to. Um, so I don't, have to ex I don't have time to explain this, but I'm, I'm gonna make a couple of points that fit with what Plantinga said. Consider the claim that a person has to base belief in Jesus on evidence in order to be justified, and then consider my grandmother. My grandmother passed away about 10 years ago, but she was a wonderful person whose faith was strong. So chances are you know similar people who are, uh, whose, whose faith is clear and obvious and who live it out. Um, my grandmother had no ed education beyond elementary school. In fact, I don't, even, I don't know if she had that. She was, you know, she was poor, uh, raised in the, in the Netherlands uh, before the Second World War. So, um, and she certainly knew nothing of the arguments for God's existence and for the purported evidence for the resurrection. And yet she believed, she believed it firmly and her life reflected that. So how did she know? And I think she did know. 
uh, the truths of the Christian faith. But how? How is it that her belief was justified? Um, not by evidence, since, as I've said, she didn't have any, or certainly not a lot. What was it then? Well, Christians would likely say, and this is where planning as view comes in, her source ultimately was the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is as reliable a source as you can come up with. So that's the idea. What matters is the source of the belief. What matters is the way the belief came to be, and not so much the evidence on which it is based. So notice I said that the Holy Spirit is reliable. Planting his entire theory of knowledge of what it means to know something or be justified in believing it turns on this notion of reliability. So here I'm going to say um, uh, something uh, more philosophical. What Planting is arguing is that um, what he's saying about knowledge and what's needed for it and, and whether evidence is needed for it, he's saying it applies to all knowledge, period. Evidence is not the central element in knowledge. Um, what did I say up here? Yeah, there you go. It applies to any kind of knowledge, including sensory knowledge. So you say to yourself, what do you mean sensory knowledge isn't based on evidence? You know, um, uh, what's required for you to know? So think about it. You're sitting in the library, you think, um, listening to a prime time presentation. Um, uh, so what's required for you to know that, Planning argues in two books, is that... Um, uh, that your eyes and ears, your sensory apparatus, are reliable. So, it is not required that you have evidence, since when you stop to think about it, your evidence is not that good. In fact, it's really mediocre. So you think you're in here um, listening to a presentation in the library of Bethel University. Well, what evidence do you have for that? Well, because it seems to you, right? You're sitting, getting these visual pictures and so on, these sounds. Um, but the obvious question is, how good of evidence is that? I mean, that's completely compatible with you being in The Matrix, for example. And this is why The Matrix is such a popular movie. I mean, period, but also among philosophers. It illustrates the problem of skepticism in a really clear way. Um, you can't rule it out. Uh, your experience that you're having is completely compatible with your being completely deceived about what's going on around you. So, um, as I say in my notes here, the evidence that you have, the sensory input that you have, is entirely compatible with your being in the matrix. Hopefully you're not, but how could you tell? In any case, Planinga's work in this area began with ordinary knowledge, and then he turned to showing that his theory had significant implications for religious belief as well. So his idea then is, like I said, is that what is required for knowledge is that your, um, whatever it is that produced the beliefs in you is reliable reliably gets you true beliefs. Well, so he argued, like I say, in a, in a whole book, this is a big issue, um, that uh, that applies to knowledge of the most basic things, right? It applies to sensory knowledge. And what he did, so I learned that in epistemology class when I was an undergraduate, and when I read this book by Steve Evans, it suddenly, the sort of light came on and thought, this applies to Christian belief too. Um, if you think, if you recognize that what matters to, to regular belief is that your faculties are working properly and reliably. Well, maybe the same thing applies to Christian belief as well. Maybe what matters for Christian belief, what makes it knowledge, isn't evidence. Instead, it's who's given you the information, right? And the Christian view is that it's the Holy Spirit. So that's the Christian truth. I'll just stick with it. The Christian view, the form view, I think this is, you know, there are differences among Christians on this. But it's the Holy Spirit who's the source of it. And like I say, the Holy Spirit is reliable. Or at least if the Holy Spirit is reliable, then what you believe is knowledge. So um, planning this theory there um, satisfies me. So as I say, the fact that the evidence for the resurrection and so on isn't convincing isn't such a problem. It doesn't, fundamentally, it doesn't matter. Um, maybe if you had really compelling counter evidence, then there would be something for you to to be concerned about. If there is really strong evidence that the biblical story isn't true, that's a different thing. But as for evidence in order to believe that it is true, that's not essential to turning your, to making your belief knowledge or to making your belief justified. So, planning his theory satisfied me then, and it still satisfies me now. If I were to base my belief in Christ solely on the evidence for the resurrection, I would likely not believe it at all. 
or if I did, I'd believe it in a very tentative way. Um, actually, I want to throw in one aside here, uh, getting back to my grandma. Oma is actually what we call it, it's Dutch, Oma. So, um, uh, I certainly wouldn't have the kind of conviction if I believed it on evidence that my grandmother had. And just one important aside there about my grandmother, I think about children, for example. Um, if God wanted us to know the Christian story, to know who Jesus was and what, what Jesus did for us, why would he make knowledge of it contingent on knowledge of this historical evidence that very few people ever hear about, right? So, um, so that would be a strange thing. If, if my grandmother couldn't know just because she isn't a you know, 21st century biblical scholar. Um, okay, but then the fact that evidence for Christian belief is far from convincing, for, for me certainly, and I think objectively it is, um, that real, it isn't that important. And that realization arrived at through the study of philosophy of religion and epistemology helped me recover my faith in college and that is a big part of the reason why the philosophy of religion matters to me. So, um, questions? I mean, I left so much uh, unsaid there since I covered an enormous amount of territory in 15 or 20 minutes. So, um, any questions? Yeah, Andrew. Sure. Um, so thank you, Ray, first of all. Uh, I think I guess what I was curious about is how you came back to that first question you raised, which is that more of the pluralism question. Yeah. Because it, it sounds like what planting a address for you is more that, that second question, how do we think about the evidence, really? Yeah. But how do we think about then our faith as believing in a particular belief about sort of um, in Christ and the divine, right? Um, as in, and how do we think about like, so people of other faiths in other places? So did you come back to that too, or is that more of a secondary issue at that point? Yeah, no, it, it is important. Um, I mean, it's important on a number of levels. So first of all, um, and that's one of the loose ends I didn't do, but I, I will um, a little bit. So yeah, I mean, if we can know that Christ is the Son of God, that the resurrection happened and so on, that Christ is unique, if we can know that just by virtue of the testimony of the Holy Spirit, um, let's say, well, then, then there you are, right? Then there's something unique about Christianity, and Christianity is uniquely true. And, if, and, and there's no problem with you, given that you know these things, and that just the source of your belief is the Holy Spirit. There's no problem with you carrying on and investigating religious pluralism from that position. Right? I mean, there is something interesting about the exercise of kind of getting outside of Christianity and seeing how, from, the, from above, seeing how they all look. But the, the question is, why do that? I mean, if you think Christian belief is true, um, why, don't you think about, why don't you start with that and then think about religious diversity accordingly? Um, so that's one thing. Now, the question about how, well, how to think about other religions, that's a really vexed question anyway. I mean, um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just say that. That doesn't follow, you know, a particular position on that doesn't follow from anything I've said so far. Um, I'll just say one thing about that. Um, you know, John Hick uh, purports to be objective and looks from above and, and says that all religions are essentially the same. But, and, he, and he also purports to be kind of friendly to all the religions. But that's not friendly to any of them, really. Uh, I mean... You know, this suggestion that we're all doing the same thing, we're all fundamentally the same, that's vastly different from most religious, what most religious groups actually believe. So there's this suggestion made that he's actually kind of invented a new religion. Um, and so that's one of the responses that people uh, make. Christians have, can have their own kind of explanation of why there are so many religions. Christians differ on that. But the idea that um, John Hick is uh, doing religions a favor by bringing us all close together. You know, that's, um, that's not necessarily the case. And I say this all, I, I didn't have much interaction with John Hick himself, but um, just a little bit, but he is a wonderful guy. I mean, he was a wonderful guy. He passed away a few years ago. And there's no doubt, you know, as they say, his heart was in the right place. It's a cheesy way to say it, but he was a very good person. Um, so it's not, like, it's not like there was ever any malevolence in the he was saying or any hatred of any religion. Yeah, Jim. 
Yeah, uh, Ray, thank you very much for this. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the evidence for Christian belief as having its source in the Holy Spirit? How is that different from, say, intuition or um, um, kind of um, a, a kind of a believism? So what, what are the grounds, uh, if you will, what is the evidence that the source of my belief is in the spirit? Yeah, I mean, um, that's a very good question. And what is the evidence? I mean, for one thing, the evidence isn't going to be conclusive at all. Because if you have evidence that the source of your belief is the Holy Spirit, well, then, then you're believing on the basis of evidence. Um, so that would, be, that would be a further argument, right? So you say, how do I know that the Holy Spirit, how do I know that um, the resurrection actually happened? Well, the Holy Spirit told me. Well, how do I know the Holy Spirit told me? Well, because it's true, you know, it really happened or something like that. So you're not going to get, in this picture, you're not going to get any good, non-question begging evidence that it's actually the Holy Spirit who's the source. So it's not like, you know, at no level is the evidence going to settle anything here. And, and the idea is that that's just the way it is. I mean, you might, dis, you know, you know, you might differentiate, you might say, well, there's some evidence that it's the Holy Spirit, and you can see it based on how people live, right? So you can say, um, in some, you know, you can say in some cases when you see people's, you know, when people have awful, harmful religious beliefs, you can say, well, that can't be from God. Whatever it is, that can't be from God, because if it were from God or the Holy Spirit or whatever, the results wouldn't be so bad. So there's a way, maybe, in which the church tests whether something is from the Holy Spirit. But that's more by, you know, that's partly by the results of, of, of belief in it. Um, so is that, I mean, there's more to say about that. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's just that um, it seems to be inconclusive. Yeah. And you would affirm that. Yes. Yeah. No, I think, I mean, and this is, this is um, just kind of the epistemological situation we're in, right? I mean... You name it, we could be wrong. I mentioned, you know, you could be wrong about your beliefs about your immediate environment. But on other things, you know, I think I think any Christian has to, you know, when you sort of back up and look at your faith, um, you have to confess, you know, you could in fact be wrong about this. We all could. Um, and this idea that, you know, I'm absolutely certain and, um, you know, the sort of, you don't want to, you know, the sort of dogmatic, belligerent kind of faith. I mean, to my mind, that that's not real. Um, that's not the way it should be. Now, that's not to say that people who have faith can't be really convinced of it, at least from time to time. Like, I don't, that I don't know what my grandmother's faith life was really like. I'm kind of reading into her based on, you know, based on what I knew of her. But I have my doubts, you know, there are moments probably, I'm sure, in her life, like, you know, a couple in mine, probably, where it is just, you're just certain. I mean, you can just feel it. Um, but then there are other moments where you think, hold on a second, what what was that? Was that was that the Holy Spirit? I mean, in the moment, I think it's the Holy Spirit, and I'm convinced of it. But you can back up and say, was that the Holy Spirit? Well, I do believe it. Can I be absolutely certain? Could I be mistaken about it? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, you can't get away from it. Skepticism never goes away. You can't. But that doesn't mean you need to be skeptical about everything all the time. You can embrace it at every moment, or you can sort of say, this is, this is what I believe, and this is how I'm going to live my life. Could I follow up? Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, you made a point about Hick uh, claiming objectivity. Uh, and uh, my guess is that you would say he wasn't so objective after all. In fact, it was highly subjective. Would you yeah. comment on that? Um, I guess it was subjective in, so you consider a Christian. Um, a Christian is going to say the way to understand religious diversity is through a Christian lens, so to speak. Um, he's going to say, no, the way to understand religious diversity is to um, shrug off all religions, religious commitments and look at it from the outside. Well, we've made different choices, right? Um, I don't think 
that's the best way to understand religious diversity. He doesn't think that my approach is the best way to understand religious diversity. So, so there's the question, well, which, which one's better? Um, and I guess, as, as I say, there's, there's the subjectivity. He uses the illustration of the elephant. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, should I tell? So yeah, that, tell tell the story of the elephant. The idea is that the real is the elephant, and we're all sort of feeling it at different points. So we, so we're all you know feeling the same thing, but interpreting things differently. That's that's the basic idea. So yeah. And of course, he knows, he knows the truth. He knows the truth about the elephant, whereas the people who are touching the tail, the leg, and so on. They they have only partial knowledge, but he, the storyteller, he knows the he knows the, the reality of right. it. And and that's what Hick is purporting to know, right? Well no, he's he calls it a hypothesis. Again, he's not an arrogant guy. He calls this a hypothesis. Where again it's it's sort of the best explanation of the religious diversity we see is that there's this big elephant, he calls it the wheel, and we're all experiencing it in these different ways. And understanding in these different ways ways and not realizing that it's all the same elephant. And that, of course, is what the service he's doing to us, um, showing us that, or telling us that, or hypothesizing that that's the case. So, yeah. And I will never belittle uh, John Hick. I think he's wrong, and sometimes people are a little harsh with him. But, like I say, he's, he's a good, very good person, very good person with interfaith dialogue. Any other questions? Yes. One other comment on the conversation you all are having. I mean, a couple of years back, I went to a talk by one of my um, former grad student colleagues in Notre Dame. He's very into interfaith dialogue between he's, he's Roman Catholic and so Roman Catholics and Muslims. And one of the points he was making was a point very similar to what you said, which is I mean, the problem with Hick, right, is that you don't take seriously the religions on their own terms, which is that we are making exclusive faith claims. So Christianity makes these claims. Islam makes these claims, right? Um, and we're making claims with that. And so he, what, he, what he said is like, when you to have really good interfaith dialogue, you need to both be deeply grounded in your own tradition, right? Not sort of seek the kind of lowest common denominator, but be deeply grounded and then be able to be gracious with each other, right? And that, that's where you are taking the claims of each of the faiths really seriously. And the concern with people like Hick is you're just sort of like trying to go, well, what are the things, let's get rid of all the things that we disagree on and then try to find only those points of agreement instead of saying, no, we're deeply rooted in this, but we still, uh, be humble enough to talk to each other. Right. And that, I right. think, is maybe a more productive way to really respect the different faith traditions. Right. No, I think that's right. So the idea is that um, John Hick realized I was supposed to kind of repeat the question uh, for the sake of the camera. But um, yeah, the idea is that uh, John Hick's sort of perspective on these different religions doesn't, in fact, um, allow us to engage in a rich kind of interfaith dialogue. Uh, and I think that's right. And I think. Um, I think that's right. And I think that the kind of um, uh, humility, which I think um, the kind of position that Planning is promoting without, I mean, it's a certain kind of humility with the recognition that um, if we know the truth, which we think we do, it's not because of how smart we are. It's not because we've gone through the arguments and we're more clever than you because you've gone through the ar arguments and you're not smart enough to see it, to see how uh, what the great evidence is. I mean, that's not that's not the approach here. And so if you recognize that, hey, we're in this kind of situation where I believe very strongly what I believe. I believe that the source of this is, um, is the Holy Spirit. I believe Jesus was unique and so on. Um, but I recognize my own situation. I recognize your beliefs. And from that perspective, we can talk about them. Um, so I think I think, yeah, this, this gives us a, a groundwork for, for real, um, rich interfaith dialogue. And of course, there's the issue of you know, interfaith engagement where we recognize in our, in our, that, that religions do, in fact, have a kind of uh, ethic uh, in common, or they tend to. And so we can engage, you know, we can engage with each other in dialogue. But we can also engage with each other on, you know, important projects that religious people are interested in. Um, so there are different ground, different kinds of interreligious engagement that that fit well with this. Any other questions? Yeah. I missed the titles of those two books you're referring to, 
Plantica and uh, the Evans? That you yeah, the, the, C, the C. Stephen Evans book is called The Historical Christ and the Jesus of Faith. Okay. So it's, it's a little bit dense, but not bad. And it's also <laughs> really, I mean, it's really good. I, I think this is a terrific book. So if you have some time to um, work through and ex get, get these ideas I just said expanded on, that would be a book that I'd recommend. And then this one, Warranted Christian Belief, as you see, this is, this is really high-level philosophy, um, as you can see by how thick it is. But where he talks about, he goes into the details. As he said before, he doesn't write to be inspiring. He writes because he really wants to know. He wants to get into the details. Hence, uh, this book and two others on more or less the same topic. So there's actually a shorter version of this planning a book. I can't remember what it's called. I um, assign it in, in epistemology and metaphysics just because this one's a little long. So yeah, I, I'd recommend some of that. I mean, this, this book too by John Hick, it is really a good, easy read. It's actually a dialogue. Um, so I, you know, I see there's no harm in reading it. There's just, you know, it's, it's a good book. It's really breezy. And uh, yeah, we get to see the, the world from his perspective. Anything else? All right.